Mark Minervini strategy explained. That's right, I got a good video lined up for you today. You can see all the different areas of Mark Minervini strategy that we're going to be covering in depth as we progress throughout this video. I would ask you to do two things for me at the start of this video. If you're not subscribed to the channel and you enjoy videos like this and you want to be notified when I release more, please do press subscribe. And if you could hit the like button for me, you'd be shocked by how much it really helps me out and helping to grow the channel. So I'd really appreciate that if you enjoy this video press the like button for me. As we progress throughout this presentation, certainly into the fundamentals area, you're going to see some charts by MarketSmith. They're today's video sponsor. If you're interested in a discounted MarketSmith chart, there is a link in the comment section below. And before we get into our first slide, which is on the price cycle, I just wanted to give you a quote which I think encapsulates Minervini's approach to trading. And it's by Floyd May Mayweather. I'm a boxer who believes that the objective of the sport is to hit and not get hit. That pretty much some up Mark Minervini's approach to trading hit and don't get hit so by the end of this video you're going to learn how to hit and not get hit and with all of that being said let's get into the price cycle the price cycle is the backbone of Minervini's strategy and Minervini splits the price cycle into four stages so there is stage one which is the neglect phase brackets consolidation there's stage two which is the advancing stage which is accumulation now this is where Minervini is looking for those VCPs those power plays those cup and handles which we're going to be coming on to a little bit later there is then stage three which is the topping phase distribution there is stage four which is the declining phase which is capitulation so this is here is a weekly chart of the Dow Jones just to give you an idea of these phases and we're going to be going through some individual stocks more recently so you can get a very good understanding of the price cycle the different stages and the transition criteria as well so you can clearly see the cyclical nature to to the Dow Jones here okay you can see that there's a advancing phase and there's a topping phase there's a capitulation phase and then there's accumulation and then we're moving back up here so you can see they're just ebbing and flowing from stage one stage two stage three stage four stage one stage two stage three phase four so on and so forth Forth, right so let's look at some more modern day examples stocks that you'll probably be familiar with so the first one here this is zoom now you probably use zoom as well you're probably aware of the growth that it had in 2020 as well so this is zoom here okay we've got stage one this is stage one down here then we move into the stage two uptrend this is then where minavini is looking for those vcp and you're going to learn about that as we progress throughout these videos how to spot them Again, the things that you want to be looking for and having that powerful market trend behind you. Then you have stage three, which tends to be a little bit more volatile. I'm going to give you some clues on the different stages in a minute. So stage three and then into the stage four decline. If we look at another one, quite recent, this is Peloton. What do you notice? You have your stage one base here. You have your stage two uptrend, your stage three distributional top and your stage four decline over here. Another one. This is this is DocuSign. Many of you will be familiar with it as well. Big stage one base over here, then the stage two uptrend, stage three distributional top, stage four more markdown. So it's very important to know where are you, and I'm going to give you some criteria to better understand where are you in terms of the price cycle. Very important that you can look at the stock, look at the market, look at an industry group ETF and go, oh, okay, we're in a stage two uptrend, we're in a stage four, we're in a stage four decline, we're potentially in a stage one um, base, we're in a volatile stage three tops. Very important to know. Let's take a look at another one. This one here is Amazon. So we're going. A little bit a little bit further back than some of the other ones but pretty much over the same time span as well what do you notice with amazon well you have a stage one base here you have a stage two uptrend you have a stage three distributional top look at the volatility in the phase three distributional top and then the volatility as you move into the stage four decline and price starts rolling over price things then below these key moving averages which we'll explain a little bit later on now we're a little bit further back so this is amgen back in the 1990s you have a stage one base here you then have a stage two uptrend see kind of the lack of volatility in the stage two uptrend as well really nice stage three distribution top and then see how it breaks down here pretty aggressively on volume as well and we're going to be talking about relative strength as we go throughout this uh, as we go throughout this video and then you have your stage four decline over here another one this is crocs so this one here got very volatile into a stage three top so you have your stage one base stage two uptrend stage three top and then your stage four decline so it's very important that you can pinpoint whereabouts are you let's then take a look at an etf that you're probably familiar with which is arc so whether it's stocks whether it's etfs whether it's the market the price cycle is applicable to all of them so you have your stage one base in here stage two uptrend look at the 52 week cars on the relative strength line we'll talk about that a little bit later on relative strength and then look at the break here into stage three so something that you're going to learn is a characteristic on a transition from stage two into stage three is actually increased volatility and increased volume as well so stage two uptrend the wind is in the proverbial sales and then stage three distributional top 
okay very volatile price action and then you are swimming against the tide in the stage four decline so maybe arc has entered a stage one base down here but it certainly as of yet is not in a stage two stage drop trend now where this can be a little bit confusing is you can think well it's stage one stage two stage three stage four it doesn't always work like that because sometimes you can transition from a stage one base this is tesla this is on the monthly chart a stage one base into a stage two uptrend and then you think that well a stage three distributional top is now going to play out but it doesn't sometimes it can transition basically back into a stage one base which we see here with tesla so it's not always just for a little spanner in the works it's not always stage one stage two stage three stage four sometimes you can get a stage one into a stage two that then transitions into kind of a stage one reaccumulation base if you like and then back into a stage drop trend and then here you can see the stage three top and then breaking down here for a stage a stage four decline so this is for all stocks all etfs all indexes across all time frames but the higher the time frame the greater weight i would give it so if i saw kind of a stage drop trend on the monthly chart or the weekly chart i would give that much more weight to a stage drop trend on say the five minute chart hopefully that point makes sense so let's go into putting a little bit more a little bit more context so this is the price cycle here so stage one neglect phase okay which is the consolidation transition criteria into a stage two advancing phase accumulation so these are minavini's words here so key technical action the share price is above the 150 day which is the 30 week and the 200 day which is the 40 week moving average the 150 day moving average is above the 200 day moving average the 200 day which is the 40 week moving average is sloping upwards and it's preferably been sloping upwards this is a little subtlety for about four to five months the share price is generally making higher highs and higher lows so that there is a nice trend higher highs higher lows what were you really looking for other, other notable action to monitor, larger volume on up weeks relative to volume on down weeks, more on up weeks than on down weeks, more up weeks than down weeks, sorry, supportive action on pullback. So I, ideally when the share price is pulling back or the price of whatever it is, whether it's the market, so the queues, the spies and the ETF, the stock, when it is pulling back, you'd like to see supportive action. So you'd like to see quick, quick recoveries and reversals, preferably holding key moving averages as well as I put down here. Let's look at a phase three topping. So this is the stage three topping phase, also known as distribution. So some of the key key action to be to be looking for that you're in a stage three top. You would have obviously liked to see a rally going into it, so a stage two uptrend. But key characteristics, key technical action that you're potentially in a stage three is increase price volatility that's obviously on a relative basis okay apples and apples pairs of pairs you want to be comparing the stock's own action to the stock's own action there's no point comparing this stock's action to google or netflix or amazon or whatever compare the action what is volatile for this stock versus its own behavior which is also then accompanied by high relative volume so if you get really volatile price action at the top of a long uptrend and then suddenly you see it's really volatile there's a lot of volume that can be institutions larger operators in the market offloading their shares aggressive declines and pullbacks so they're not kind of nice and gentle. They're very volatile, very aggressive, widespread candle six to the downside on volume. Price no longer respects or holds key moving averages. So you're kind of seeing violation to key moving averages. Maybe they were once holding as support like the 50 day or the 21 day was holding as support, but now you just see prices slicing through them. Climactic behavior, rapid price advance accompanied by high relative volume, which is basically feeding in to the increased volatility point. But you might see towards the end of a stage two, that a stock in the last three weeks has gone up, say, 25%, but in the most recent three weeks, it's suddenly up 75%, and the share price advance is very rapid. We're going to talk about that as we come on to sell rules a bit later. Other notable action that you could be in a stage three topping phase, the base count of the stage two uptrend is 4-4 four, four later. So I've got an example of LUV on the weekly chart and looking at bases as we go on. So looking for late stage bases, they are much more failure prone. Sector and or group is weak and or volatile price action. Key moving averages beginning to flatten or roll over. So potentially say like the 50 day was just pointing up nicely, but now you start to see it's kind of rolling over and topping like this. That can be something to be looking out for. You could have a material deceleration in the earnings. You can have earnings are unsustainably high so i've got a couple of charts of say zoom that you're going to see and you're going to see this with a lot of stocks and this is a quote by manavini as well the stock can actually top out when the earnings are the highest so we'll look at that in a couple of slides time and the overall market position has the overall market just gone from a powerful stage two uptrend then into what looks like a very volatile stage three top because the market trend is going to significantly affect stocks let's take a look at some 
transition criteria so you've now entered stage three and then we're looking for the transition criteria into a stage four decline which is basically a stock you really want to uh, you really want to evolve so key technical action the share price and this is basically the opposite of everything that we were saying from stage one transitioning into stage two the share price is below the 50 day which is the 10 week the 150 day the 30 week and the 200 day being the 40 week moving averages the 50 day moving average is below the 150 day and 200 day moving averages so you're starting to get the moving averages rolling over and in a in terms of an uptrend you would like to see the 50 above the 150 above the 200 whereas in a stage four decline you're often seeing the opposite so the 50 is below the 150 the 150 is below the 200 okay so on and so forth the 150 day 30 week moving average is below the 200 day 40 week moving average the 200 day 40 week moving average is sloping down so it's kind of topped and rolling back over like this the share price is generally making lower highs and lower lows excuse that extra low in there so lower highs and lower lows so it's now in the context of a downtrend rather than higher highs and higher lows that we'd like to see in a stage two uptrend notable other notable action to monitor significant declines on the stock and or weekly chart accompanied by the largest volume since the rally begun so if you go and watch back this section and you go and look at some of those charts like crocs like zoom like peloton like arc so on and so forth you'll see that the breaks that come through oftentimes are accompanied by the largest relative volume since the rally has begun the technical action of related stocks so these are brother sister stocks stocks in the same industry group are you seeing a lot of breakdowns in the industry group the technical action of the market sector and group as well so yes you want to be looking at the individual stock but what is the market doing what is the sector doing what is the group doing have they just undergone phase three distributional tops and then into a stage four decline or do they still look pretty powerful stage two stage two uptrends and this stock is then showing a lot of relative weakness so things to think about there the earnings reaction as well we're going to look at this later on looking at the earnings reaction you get a very good sense of what are the larger operators in the market doing especially if it's more more can slim type names what are they doing around the earnings do you see positive or negative reaction so that there is very key and we'll look at that a little bit later on so that ends our section for the price cycle in the next section we're going to be going into explaining the volatility contraction pattern the volatility contraction pattern explained also known as the vc so the VCP is a pattern itself, but the same characteristics are found in other chart patterns. That may have just really confused you, but by the end of this section, hopefully it'll make some more sense. What's happening from a supply and demand perspective is the most important. So as we work through the examples in this section, by the end, I'm hoping by understanding and kind of teaching you about price and volume what is happening from a structural perspective the higher lows in the base the tightness the volume declining in key places you will start to understand that the vcp is a visual representation of what is going on with supply and demand but we first want to begin with well what on earth is the point of a vcp well the point of a vcp so volatility contraction pattern is to create a low risk repeatable entry point with asymmetric reward to risk potential and you have an idea of what should of what should happen next for normal and abnormal behavior so as we start going through this presentation there are slides on what you want to see after the breakout point and what you don't want to see after the breakout point so normal and abnormal behavior this then really helps you with the trade management aspects as well so the vcp is a very repeatable point on the chart to identify which is very good because of the deliberate practice nature of things and also skill acquisition so you really want to acquire the skills to identify the vcp and then understand how to trade it and improve your skill set around trading it as well so several key points here and then we'll go and work through this example so several key points price is in a strong uptrend everything that we just discussed in the in the criteria for a stage two uptrend higher lows are forming in the base is preferable the depth of the contractions are lessening we'll talk about that volume lessening on pullbacks versus rallies final contraction single figure percentage that's to help control your risk tightness in bars before the breakout we're going to be talking about a little concept that i also call trigger bars but minavini calls it the one two punch so we'll talk about that in a few slides time ideally you'd like to see volume on the breakout and after the breakout here you would like to see what minavini calls tennis ball action so after the breakout you would like to see higher highs and higher lows higher highs higher lows which is the definition of an uptrend so let's work through this example here so what we're going to say is price rallied from 50 dollars down here up to the pivot point and the pivot point is also the buy point in essence okay so it's like pivot buy point if you like so price has rallied from 50 dollars to 100 dollars so it's gone up 100 percent 
and then it's been riding its 50 day moving average. So for the purpose of this, we're just gonna use one moving average to keep the charts nice and simple. So this is gonna be our 50 day. And generally speaking, the stock has found supportive action around the 50 day and it does after the breakout as well. There was one kind of undercut and reclaim, which is a good thing. Remember we looked at the quickness of the recoveries and the reversals. So ideally if price undercuts a key moving average, you'd like to see that be very short lived. It recovers quicker. So price moves up to $100 and then it starts building VCPs or a VCP. So there's three contractions in this space. We have contraction one that takes the share price from $100 down to $85, so about a 15% decline. Price rallies back up to $100 and then pulls back down to $90 each time for the purpose of this finding support of action around the 50 SMA. But this could be the 21 EMA or whatever, whatever you want to use. So now it pulls back down 10%. So we've had a decline, first contraction of 15% rally, second contraction here of 10%, so 100 down to 90. And then we rally and then a contraction of 5% which is then from $100 down to $95. So we now have that the depth of the contractions lessening from left to right and building higher lows. That's very good. Just as a rough kind of, um, a rough kind of indicator. Ideally, the contractions are pretty much halving in terms of percentages each time. So you could go from like 20% to 10% to 5%. It doesn't always have to be that kind of perfect, but the better ones will. You'll generally see that the depth of the contractions are roughly halving each time, but certainly the final contraction over here, you'd like it to be in single figures. Now you'd also, in terms of percentages, now you'd also like to see the volume on the pullbacks declining relative to the volume that you're seeing on the increases. Why? Because that's an indication that there's more demand stepping in on rallies and then there is a lack of supply, lack of selling pressure coming through on the declines. So it's a combination of two things. It's a combination of the depth of the declines are lessening each time and preferably building higher lows. So higher lows are bullish, it's positive price action, but the volume also confirming that there is a lessening of supply. There's supply has stopped coming to market as Minervini would call it. And then you're looking for this tight final contraction here, preferably in single figures. So then your stop loss can go underneath the final contraction. Now it's not always that simple just to go stop loss underneath the final contraction. I will show you a lot of variations, but that there as a good kind of barometer, okay, is a good starting point for us. Let's go on to our, uh, let's go on to our next slide which is going to be the volatility contraction pattern. So it's still a volatility contraction pattern because volatility contracts, but this is called the 3C. So the cup completion cheat. And I've got a couple examples as we go through here. So let's say here, well, let's actually do, what is the difference between a VCP that we just went through and say a 3C or a low pivot or a mid pivot? It's basically where you're getting the tight final contraction is lower on within the base. So you'll hear, and I've got a sl slide a little bit later on, Minervini talk about a low cheat, a cheat, and then also basically a higher, higher base breakout. So you get these pivot points form in different areas of a base. So you can get them forming in the lower third, the middle third, or the higher third. So a 3C invariably forms in the lower third to the to the to the lower half, pretty much. If I walk through this example, it then make a little bit, little bit more sense. But some keys to be looking for it's still like price to be in a strong uptrend. Now, price within 8% of the 50 day moving average. So with a 3C, a cup completion cheat, Minervini will buy it underneath the 50 day, but as long as price is within 8% of the 50 day. But for the purpose of this, I've actually shown it setting up. Now, the best candidates invariably will set up above the 50 day moving average. Shakeouts in the base with quick recovery. So you see here how we go down to $90 and then we quickly recover. Tightness in pivot might be a mini VCP. So you could have a larger base forming, and I've got an example to show you a little bit later on. You could have a larger base forming, but because of the fractal nature of the market, you could have a VCP form within a VCP. So if you look at this area in here, we actually have a VCP that then forms in the context of a larger base pattern, a larger VCP and or cup and handle type pattern. Uh, you want to see tightness in the bars before the breakout. So this is the one, two punch also called trigger bars in my definition. Uh, you want to see volume lessening on pullbacks versus rallies, as we discussed on the previous slide. You want to see the final contraction in single figure percentages, again, to control the risk, volume on the breakouts and tennis ball action thereafter the breakout. So higher highs, higher lows, higher highs, higher lows. So when we're looking at this here, 
This is the 50 day. So price found support of action on the 50 day and then it undercut it, made a lower high in here, then makes a lower low, quick recovery, and then it reclaims the 50 and starts putting in these contractions over here. Now imagine if these contractions this time are going, say, this could be, say, maybe 7.5%, then 5%, then 2.5% over here. So, or, well, we'll say 5%. So this pullback here could be 5%, then maybe it's 4%, then maybe it's here, it's kind of 2.5%, 3%, something like this. So you're still getting the V. CP action is then making some higher lows in here. Volatility is contracting because we can see that is going into a tightening range and look how the volume is just drying up and then oftentimes the day before, so the bar or the candlestick before the breakout can often be the lowest volume that you see within the base or very low relative volume, certainly underneath the 30 bar moving average for the, uh, for the volume. This one here is the power play, also known as the high tight flag. So some several keys is you'd like to see price advance greater than 100% in less than eight weeks. So you can see here, we're going from $50 to $100. So 100% price advance in less than eight weeks. The peak to trough decline is less than 20 to 25%. Now that's an indication of strength because if the stock goes up 100% or more and then it only pulls back around 20, 25% maximum, that's an indication of strength, especially if we dial it in, look at some of the individual candlesticks, is the stock then respecting key moving averages? The 21 EMA, is going to be much more applicable for a power play slash high tight flag than the 50. The 50 is kind of probably going to be lagging over here um, somewhere. So I would suggest the 21 EMA or the 20 day, if you want to have the 20 day, is going to be a useful moving average to have on your chart because oftentimes you can then see that the stock is respecting its 21 EMA and then kind of that really tight final contraction sets up around the 21 EMA, but it could also be the 10 EMA as well. That's just a suggestion by uh, me. Tightness in bars before, preferably the base is building high lows, volume lessing on pullback versus rallies the final contraction ideally in single figures to control the risk the volume on the breakout and you'd like to see tennis ball thereafter as well so high highs high lows just on the final contraction single figure percentages it's also the, the reason it's important is, is to also control the risk but it's also an in indication that there isn't much selling pressure there isn't much supply coming to the market if the volume is dried up on a relative basis say below the 30 bar average okay and it's building higher lows it's just an indication that actually yeah there isn't there isn't too much supply that's coming to the market so let's go on to the next slide which is going to be cup and handles cheats and low cheats so often lower pivots can form within a cup with handle pattern so minovini has three he has the low cheat which is in the lower third of the cup he has the cheat which is in the middle third of the cup and then the handle the kind of traditional william o'neill handle in the upper third of the cup so let's go on to a slide to illustrate it so this is a cup with handle pattern and you'll see that i've pointed to a 3c here so a cup completion cheat because you see as price comes down this is our 50 day so imagine we've gone from say 70 dollars to 100 dollar pivot here price then loses the 50 day rallies into it puts in a lower high falls down but then do you see in this region in here well we now have a mini vcp so we actually have a vcp form at the low of the cup and then we have a vcp form in the handle as well so it's quite common that you'll see these little vcps where volatility basically contracts remember it's a pattern in and of itself but it's a characteristic of other patterns as well so here you can see we have well we have one contraction then we have two contraction three contraction building high lows the volume really dries up before this receipt and then it reclaims the 50 day moving average so this is where minovini was talking about with a 3c so that kind of low that low cheat he will look for it within eight percent of the 50 day so it can be eight percent below the 50 day moving average which is what i'm trying to illustrate here just the subtlety on a cup and handle as you then transition up and out the right hand side of the of the cup you want to see bullish price action widespread decent volume coming through as well and then up here this would then be the kind of traditional handle you see how you get some vcp action going on as well one contraction two contraction three contraction breakout and then you get your higher highs your higher lows so your tennis ball action several keys with a cup and handle peak to trough decline less than 30 percent so what i've illustrated here from a hundred dollars down to seventy dollars tightness in the bars before the breakout so over here and also over here, volume lessening, strong rally out of the cut, final contraction again in single figures for everything that we have been uh, everything that we have been discussing. So that is it for understanding a bit of the VCPs. I've got a lot of examples to go through a little bit later. On the next slide, we're going to be looking at a study of when do VCPs work best. So I'm going to take you through some of my own research for a study of when VCPs work best. And there are 3,000 breakouts in the next slide that I'm going to show you. But this is the Dow Jones. 
And again, it's just showing you the price cycle we're on the monthly chart, this time from 1944 into the 1960s. So you can see these green areas here, which is indicating a strong market trend. So any breakout strategy, whether it be the likes of Minervini, Weinstein, O'Neill, Livermore, Darvis, so on and so forth, ideally you want a strong market trend behind behind you that proverbial tide lifting all boats the wind in your sails if you're trying to do it in these red zones where it's a phase three top or a phase four decline it's going to be much much harder so the market trend is very 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 important this final period here that you see this is when darvis made his proverbial two he made it well it's not proverbial he made his two million in the market ran about 50 million in today's money in a period of about 18 months two years so it was this period in here where darvis i'm sure many of you read that book it was this period in here so that strong market trend behind you thinking about it from a price cycle is very very important so if you take a look here Okay, this is my own, this is my own research. So within this database, there are 3,000 breakouts, okay, 3,000 different breakouts. And I'm looking from the period of 1986 to 2000 and 20 and 2022 and what i'm looking at is when do these breakouts happen and looking at it from a context of the market trend and a longer term market trend so what i'm looking at is when the nasdaq composite which is applicable for the stocks i trade stocks minavini trades as well okay when are these breakouts happening relative to when the nasdaq comp is in an uptrend versus a downtrend and i simply define that as the nasdaq comp either above its monthly 10 ema or below its monthly 10 ema so this here this is the monthly 10 ema for the dow jones so you can see how well just really really simple simplicity is often the best you see how when the 10 ema is trending up and prices above it you get the nice uptrend when prices below it and kind of chopping down that is when i'm saying that you're in a phase three distribution top and or a phase four decline so what i'm doing here is looking okay when are these breakouts happening? What is the importance of the market trend behind you, that tide lifting all boats? Well, 90.77%, so pretty much 91% of the 3,000 breakouts in this in this database, which include the breakouts from Minervini's book, from O'Neill book, from Weinstein's book, from Darvis book, from me just looking at thousands and thousands and thousands of them. Okay, 91% are occurring in a month that the NASDAQ composite closed above its monthly 10 EMA. So that longer term trend on your side is very important. So if you look at these green zones here, just to kind of put it into perspective, if you look at these green zones, 91% of those 3,000 breakouts are occurring in these green zones. Okay, I know they weren't actually, the database is not for this period in time, but this is just a visual illustration. Only 9% are pretty much happening in these red zones. Okay, so these green zones are where 91% pretty much of these VCPs, these power plays, these cup and handles are occurring. The longer term market trend on your side is very, very, very important indeed. So you could almost think about it, are you in a 91% environment or are you in a 9% environment? So the longer term trend also being in a confirmed stage two uptrend for the general indexes, that tide lifting all boats, the wind in the sails, I cannot stress the importance of that. So hopefully that side was, was, uh, was enlightening for you. And now we're gonna be going deep down into VCP and I'm going to show you VCPs from over 100 years ago. So carrying on with our Dow Jones theme, you can see we've got it loaded up here from 1926, 1927, and 1928. And what do you notice? Well, you probably just spotted a VCP, haven't you? And you're probably like, what? How did a VCP form nearly 100 years ago, 97 years ago at the time of filming this video? How on earth did that happen? And wait till you see the next slide as well. This is back in 1904. This is over 110 years ago. Look at this, one contraction, two contraction, three contraction, tight, 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 then the breakout coming through. Why on earth is that happening? Well, VCP is a visual representation of supply and demand forces at work. It is the effect. It is not the cause. So the VCP is not the cause. The VCP is the effect of supply and demand, accumulation and distribution. Okay, it is one contraction, two contraction, three contraction, four contraction. Do you see how the depth of the contraction, they're not quite halving each time, but certainly as we start getting into the second, third and fourth contraction, they're pretty much halving each time. We're going from a 12% decline to a 5% decline to a 2.5% decline. Now this is a little subtlety that we're gonna pick up on in this video. The pivot point, okay, the pivot buy point is not always the higher the base. Okay, it's not always right up here, the highs of the base. It's where supply has stopped coming to market. This is what a Minervini studied Livermore intensely, what Livermore called the line of least resistance. So the VCP and understanding it is helping you to identify the line of least resistance. Where has supply stopped coming to market? Where is it really dried up? Where can you create a more asymmetric risk versus reward trade? And here's the Dow Jones. So 
This is coming off of the bear market lows in 1903 into 1904. So first contraction here, 8%. Next one, 5%. Next one here, third contraction, 1.5%. Now note the extremely tight candlestick. This is on the weekly chart in the context of how the VCP has developed. So you see the tightness of this bar, and we're going to be talking about this about the one-two punch and i also call it a trigger bar see the tightness of this bar it's extremely extremely tight now i know we don't have the volume on the chart but imagine that the volume is very low so you've gone through the proper basing action one contraction two contraction three contraction above the key moving averages that are now starting to turn back up as well on the weekly chart then you get this really tight bar and the volume on this bar would have been very low as well that's indicating supply has stopped coming to market there's hardly any selling around so this is the cause, sorry, this is the effect. It is not the cause. It's understanding what is going on from a supply and demand perspective of accumulation of absorption of supply. Now let's start going through some actual slides. So this one here, this is the exporting goods. Now, something to be kind of aware about is V-shaped. Okay, so you can see with with DKS here, and I wanted to do this one before we go into some of the more detailed ones. Do you see how this is very V-shaped in nature? It hasn't actually had time to go through the proper VCP um, action, so constructive VCP action, where you actually then get a mini. So you see this is then, it turns out to be a cup and handle type pattern, and then you get a mini VCP forming within the handle here. It's still a decent size, around about four or five weeks or so, isn't it? Some shakeout demand tails, price bouncing off the 50 SMA. So these moving averages here, this is the daily chart, black line is the 10 EMA, blue line the 21, and the purple line here is the 50 SMA. But you see how here, DKS goes from the low of the base recovers quickly but it then runs up very very quickly so it's running into overhead resistance there are going to be trapped buyers within this space who have ridden this stock down as soon as they get back up near break even what do you think they're going to be doing they're going to be pressing sell so then that, that supply comes to the market but then the stock starts basing out correctly and then look at the tightness that you get over here look how the volume dries up as well and something else to be looking for i'll start talking about it now is relative strength so relative strength is extremely important why because relative strength will lead you to the best opportunities in the market because relative strength it's not my opinion it's not your opinion it's the opinion of the market now i have a free relative strength line on trading view search my name in the indicators you'll find it you'll be able to uh, use it do you see how dks here is hitting 52 week highs it's hitting 52 week highs in the base it's hitting 52 week highs very soon after the breakout as well if it's got 52 week highs and a very strong relative strength line it's an indication that the stock is a leader in the market at that present moment in time so don't rush the vcp let it go for through the constructive proper VCP action. You can see a little VCP in here as well. See that one contraction, two contraction, tight, tight, tight for this little lower, lower pivot and then out it goes. So let's start going through some. So this one here, this is Cyrus Logic. Now this is more of your standard VCP, your volatility contraction pattern, higher base breakout. I've got some low mid pivots and all, all, all sorts of variations to show you in, in, um, in slides to come. So with Cyrus Logic here, it pulls back down for the first contraction, bounces. It then actually tightens up in here for a mid pivot because it's pretty much in the middle of the base. And then it comes up to the high. So it's now running into this overhead resistance. So it's logical, isn't it? Price is running up. There's trap buyers up here. There's supply that comes to the market. The stock has to absorb that supply. So then we're looking for that constructive VCP action. And within this region here, we actually get a mini VCP within the context of a larger VCP and or cup and handle. So fractal nature of the market patterns will form within patterns. So here you actually have one contraction, two contraction, three contraction. Look at the tightness coming through. Now, this is a concept that I'm going to be talking to you about as well, which Minivini calls the one two punch. I just call it the trigger bar because visually for me, this is what I'm looking for as well. So at the end of a proper VCP, invariably you will see an extremely tight range bar on low relative volume and the volume can often be very close to the lowest in the base if not the lowest in the base so this is the volume here in this black line is the 30 bar moving average for the volume so you see how the volume dries up and look at the tightness in price in the context of a proper vcp this is an indication supply has stopped coming to market the stock is ready to move then ideally you'd like to obviously see a powerful breakout but a common theme you're going to see on the best of the best is this kind of one-two punch, this volume really drying up, tight, tight, tight bar, preferably sitting on this black line here is the 10 EMA. That's just something I found. Invariably, that trigger bar is going to come through around the 10 EMA and or 21 EMA. 52 week highs, good volume. Look how the moving averages are just sloping up like this. They're kind of fanned out in a way as well. So let's go and do a VCP, so a low and mid pivot. Now this is eBay in here. 
So we'll actually start over here. eBay is obviously in the context of a very powerful uptrend. This was soon after its IPO. We can see it's a leader. We got the 52 week highs. Look at the bouts of volume coming through as well. And look at the kind of relationship with price as well these widespread candlesticks minavini uses bars i personally like candlesticks which is why i've used candlesticks but you get these widespread candlesticks look at the volume coming through fantastic stocks in a powerful uptrend then it here it starts to base so see how it pulls down find support on the blue line the 21 ema and then it builds this mini little cup and handle it's like a low handle so a low pivot so see how you get this tightness here so remember the volatility contraction pattern, the volatility contraction is a pattern that you see within other patterns. So this is more of a kind of cup with a very low handle, so a low pivot. Look how the volume dries up, you get that one, two punch, really tight bar before it goes again. So this tightness in price, low relative volume, really key to look for. Now this is more of your kind of classic mid, mid to low pivot, I would say it's more of a mid pivot. So you have the first contraction here, bounce run into this overhead supply so it's very logical you've got a lot of trap buyers up here they get back near break even oh, they're going to press sell sell orders flood the market price pulls back down but look how you build a higher low you get what i call a shakeout demand tail on the low here this is a gap down reversal bar as well but this shakeout demand tail then you bounce and look how tight the third contraction is i'm sure many of you would have read darvis's book as well oftentimes you can actually see the the, the final contraction maybe that's the third contraction maybe it's the fourth maybe it's just kind of a low pivot forming within the base oftentimes you can actually see a mini Darvis box which is pretty much a rectangle so these sideways consolidations are really ideal to see it may only be kind of four or five bars as we're seeing here these mini kind of Darvis boxes forming but that's very good to be looking for so you get this mini Darvis box forming right around the 10 21 and 50 SMA look how the volume dries up for the one-two punch then add it goes so no I, I keep on labeling this what are the characteristics of the final candlestick so it's, what is the characteristic what is it looking like before the stock moves out really really important to study this in a very deliberate very deliberate manner this is icpt so this again is more of a mid pivot so the stock has a huge move up here going from around about 60 50 to 405 dollars okay huge huge move look at the volume coming through and then it pulls back into its 10 ema so the black line is the 10 ema blue line 21 purple line is the 50 gray line is the 100 and then the red line here is the 200 so our moving averages are like this the stock is clearly in a stage to uptrend and then you see here remember that i was just talking about that mini darvis box forming as well we'll see how for a what's that maybe 10 bars eight eight ten bars in here you're just moving sideways and look how the volume is just stair stepping down i'm very visual for how i learn so do you see how the volume is trending down but it's also kind of stair stepping down as well that's really good to see so your volume stair stepping down kind of tight sideways consolidation think of it as a rectangle little Darvis box as well and then you can see tightness of the final bar volume dries up I think that's probably the lowest volume bar thus far in the base what arguably the tightest candlestick as well and then it goes and see how price is sitting on the 10 EMA so you could be thinking on this bar here well this is this is this is this is a uh, this is where the volume is dried up it's a tight bar yes but it's extended from the 10 EMA so what I would say is when you're doing this and you're studying and you're building out your own model but look for price to at least be around the 10 EMA and the 21 EMA may be there as well, It'll just help you kind of maybe avoid some of the extended stocks like up here. You see how price is kind of, it's wedged up here. This is a little subtlety. Price is wedged up here, it's extended short term, but over here it kind of pulls back in, little Darvis box action again, the volume dries up. So the 10 EMA at a minimum, I think is something, something you wanna look for, certainly on power plays. This is a cup completion cheat. So this one here, I've chosen this one because it's kind of like the rounding out of a cup, but sometimes you can you can see what looks to be kind of the rounding out of a cup and handle, but then no handle forms. So this is why understanding the cup, the cup completion cheat, so the low cheat and the cheat is effective because sometimes you can think, well, I'll buy it if a, if a handle forms up here, but no handle forms. So what we have is stock here, we have a positive reaction to the earnings. We get a very good sense, especially if it's more so kind of a growth stock, a can, a can slim name, of what are, what are the bigger boys doing? What are the large operators, the institution doing around the earnings? Well, if we see huge relative volume coming through, positive price action, and the stock moving up like this, it's probably an indication, certainly if the stock's not just run up 100% from a base, and it then goes and builds a base, we get an indication that actually larger operators potentially accumulating this stock, especially maybe if there was a very positive earnings surprise coming through, 
on the earnings and the sales or, or something like that. We can see that there's good volume and good price out, price advance prior to the rally or prior to the base as well. So this rally, there's a lot of evidence that there's some there, there's some strong demand for this stock. Why? We're seeing it in the price action. We're seeing it in the volume. We've got the 52-week highs on the relative strength line. The rally has gone up 94%. And then peak to trough, we pull back down 27%. So we're in that kind of 30% ballpark for a cup and handle. And then see how price respects the 50 here. This shake out demand tail onto the 50. Then we bounce, put in this high low, and then look at this here, okay? Look at the tightness in price and consistently low volume. And what does that mean? It means there's very little supply coming to the market. Look how the volume dries up. So you get tightness in price, volume drying up, and it's kind of that trigger bar type action. It's the one, it's the one, two punch. Look how tight this bar is. You actually get the tightest bar in the base and the lowest volume it looks like within the base before price breaks out like this. So it's an indication there is no more supply coming to the market. Now these these kind of what I just call I just call them trigger bars, okay? But you call it a one one two punch bar, whatever you want to call it. It does a couple of things. In the context of a proper base, it tells you gives you an indication that there's very little supply coming to market so price should move quickly through this level but it also means that you can control your risk as as well and we'll come on to stop loss placements a little bit later on in the uh, in the video this one here, this is a power play slash high type flag. So we can see that the stock here from the lower this bar here to here, stock's gone up 392%. And the peak to trough decline is 26%. And you might be saying, well, earlier on in the video, you said it's got to be between 20% and 25%. Apply a little bit of common sense here, okay? The stock has gone up 396%. And then from the top of this bar, which is a supply chute, to the lower this bar, which is a demand tail, is only gone down 26%. That is an extremely strong stock and it holds its 10 EMA. And then it builds this flag type pattern. And if you take a look, it's actually building higher lows within the base with some volatility contraction pattern characteristics. Why? Well, if you look here, we're building the higher lows. We've got kind of one contraction, two contraction, three contraction, really tight. Look how the volume is generally drying up. Certainly in the last three days, we get these multiple tight candlesticks. This is saying that there's very little supply coming to the market and prices respecting the 10 EMA. The strongest of the strong kind of power play high type flags will respect their 10 EMA and or 21 EMA as well. Just a little subtlety here. This is to apply to VCPs and also power plays. Note the prior trend of the stock. This is just my own, own uh, just my own experience basically. That if a stock is trending up and it's staying above all the key moving averages and it's not chopping around underneath them like this, it's just all over the place, it could be a much better stock to trade because it's a smooth mover. So if you then think about your trade management rules, and we're gonna come on to that later on in terms of Minavini and when to sell, ideally you want to see a stock that is less choppy. It's just a smooth mover because the trade management side of things could then be easier. Because if you're gonna use a key moving average or two as your trailing stock, ideally you would like to see the stock has respected that in the prior rally. The reason is, in my view, the best indication of how a stock is gonna act in the future, how has it acted in the past? Stocks like humans have personality characteristics. When you build out your model books, you will probably come to the same conclusion um, as well. Just another thing on this one. If a stock hits, so you see this, you see these blue dots in here, the stock is hitting 52 week highs while it's still in the base. On my relative strength line, if a stock is hitting 52 week highs while it's still basing in the context of a power play or a VCP, it's telling you it's extremely, extremely strong. It's that proverbial basketball being held underneath water. Now the next one here, this is the cup with handle and VCP. So I just really wanna stress the point that the VCP, it doesn't always have to look like a perfect or one contraction, two contraction, three contraction. It's a characteristic. The volatility contracting is a characteristic you'll see in a lot of these other chart patterns, whether it be flags, whether it be cup and handles, whether it be Darvis boxes. Okay, so you can see here, we get this cup and handle. Note how BA Systems, this is a Bay Systems, this is a UK stock. Note how it's pretty new in terms of its IPO as well. So the 50 kicks in here, the stock respects the 50, which is a good spot for larger operators to come in and step in. And then you see over here, it actually builds out a mini cup and handle because there's little one contraction, then it's tightening. See how you get the volume drop, the one, two punch. What are the characteristics of that final candlestick? Then the powerful breakout comes through. So it's very important to understand from a pattern recognition standpoint, what are the repeatable patterns you see? And then in the pivot, so i.e. just before price breaks out in the pivot, as the pivot is developing, what are the characteristics you see? What do you see? Where is, where are the final bars of the final candlesticks in relation to key moving averages? What is the volume doing? What are the characteristics of said candlesticks or bars? Really important to study everything in an extremely deliberate manner. So this tightness in price gives you two things. It tells you not much supplies coming to the markets in the context of the 
overall chart pattern, but it also enables you to better control your risk as well, create more asymmetric recessible trades, and price should move very quickly through that level because there's little supply coming to market. So some demand coming in can quickly tilt those supply and demand scales. Price can move out rapidly. You can free roll the trade and then look to ride the trend. Also, just a little subtlety, Look at the volume and the rapid price advance coming in before this base builds. Really good to see. Look at the 52 week highs as well. Strong, strong, strong stop. So let's go into this VCP 1 2 punch, which I would just call a trigger bar. Um, for me, in my head, that is the proverbial final piece of the jigsaw puzzle that I'm looking for when I see a VCP, a power player, a cup and handle, Darvis Works, whatever it may be for. So the trigger bar does two main things as I've been blabbering on about. One, in the context of a proper base, indicates little supplies coming to market, and two, enables tighter risk control. Those two things are really, really, really important. So this one here, this is ticker Kala. So it's a power play. So the stock goes up from here to here, goes up 130%. Now peak to trough, it only pulls back to the lower this demand tail, 13%. So you have a stock that goes up 113, 130% and then only pulls back 13%. It's telling you it's extremely strong. It's ridiculously strong. And then what do you see over here? The extremely tight candlestick sitting on the 10 EMA. And this here is your one-two punch. Look how the volume dries up. But what I would say is ideally, just for me, this is my own experience, I like to see at a minimum the 10 EMA there for a power play. So you see here how price isn't, because I want to get my initial stop loss ideally underneath the 10 EMA. For me, that's just just a better better kind of aid if you like a, a tool a guideline for where i want to be so up here yes price is very very tight and you're getting the kind of the one two punch but the stop loss well i'd have to put it all the way down here and the risk versus reward is getting a little bit out of whack so you see here you would have been filled here and then knocked out here so i just like to see the, the kind of tenny mate hopefully that point is kind of sinking up so like here you see how you get this one two punch coming through but my stop loss could be underneath the lower this bar which is pretty much going to tie in underneath the tenny mate so pretty much at a minimum what i'm saying there for me i would like my stop loss to be underneath the 10 EMA. That's just my experience. It's not covered in the book. I'm just giving you a little bit of my little bit of my experience there. 52 week highs, 52 week highs on the breakout bar. So a couple other other subtleties here. If you get a 52 week high in the base, it's very very strong stock. If you get a 52 week high on the breakout, it's a very strong stock indeed. Indeed. So you can see the 52 week high coming through on this breakout here, and then over here for this final one, 52 week high blue dot coming from the breakout. Really 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 good to see. Now let's go into the primary base. So the primary base is basically the first viable base following an IPO. So sometimes it can happen like this, that it actually occurs, I'm going to show you Pega, I'm going to show you Amazon as well. So you can see Pega here, it actually builds out a cup and handle type pattern. So this is more than a mid pivot slash handle, it's more of a handle, it's a little bit higher. So here's your proverbial cup, then here's your handle, you get the tightness in price, but a Darvis box action, see how price basically just goes sideways for around about eight, bar, eight bars, you get a 52 week high in the base. What have been been saying? 52 week high in the base, extremely strong stop breaks out and then this is more of a classic vcp because you do have one contraction here you sorry first contraction second contraction and then you tighten over here what do you notice okay that little kind of rectangle so again just visually this is very very visual in terms of pattern recognition i'm going to talk to you in the final slide of this presentation about how you can improve your vcp skill set but do you see how you get this tight action here and look how the volume dries up this looks just visually like the lowest volume within the base and see where it's sat just on the 10 ema Okay, do you see that? So number one, it tells you in terms of a proper basing action, very little supply coming to market. If it's then sat on the 10 EMA as well, it, at least the 10 EMA, it then, can, it then can enable tighter risk control to create more favorable reward to risk trades as well. So it's very, very important looking for those kind of one, two punches, those proverbial trigger bars um, as well. But this is basically when a stock IPOs, Oftentimes it can sell off in the first couple of days, first weeks, first months. So you're then looking for that first basing action. And the first basing action is basically then the first prudent time if you're trading VCPs to then be looking for looking for a entry point. Amazon. So you can see here with Amazon, initially sells off after the IPO. It's very, very common to see that. If a stock doesn't, and if you remember, you can go back, if you go and look at Dick's Sporting Goods, that was actually an IPO. And that's the one I was talking about, the V-shaped rally. And then it went through the constructive basing action. Dick's Sporting Goods had a very good rally straight from the IPO. That there can also be a sign of, a sign of strength to be looking at. But Amazon sells off. It then puts in some VCP action, much more of a low pivot down here. So you have one contraction, two contraction, tight, 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 tight. Look how the volume dries up. Then big volume comes in 52 highs stocks a leader and then see how it pulls back down here and you get one contraction two contraction three contraction look at the tightness look at the volume drying up then very soon after the breakout there's your 52 week highs coming through so it's not always 
kind of down here maybe there was an entry maybe there wasn't volume did dry up on on that bar here i would say that one is much harder um to kind of identify in in real time so to speak than this one this one in here but see how price comes back up to near the highs of the base absorbs the supply and then these multiple tight candlesticks and the volume drying up is also telling you something it's telling you especially if prices rally to the highs and then you start to get these tight candlesticks and volume drying up it's telling you there is not much supply coming to market that's very good in the context of a proper basing uh, forming as um, as well. So let's now go on to positive signals after an entry. So we're going to look at positive signals and negative signals after an entry. These are in Minovini's uh, own words. I may paraphrase it a little bit. The, but the position shows you a profit immediately. There is follow through buying demand. So the share price is then just going up afterwards. Widespread candle six or bars. Volume coming through. 52 week highs on the RS line would be very good. More up days and or weeks and down weeks. Strong closes on bars slash candle six. That tennis ball action. Higher highs, higher lows. Higher volume on the rallies. Low volume pullbacks. Price holds above. Key moving averages such as the 20 day and the 50 day negative signals after an entry low volume on the breakout followed by high volume back in so it kind of goes on low volume and then just pulls back down so kind of a fake out breakout three to four consecutive lower lows on high relative volume more down bars more down bars and candlesticks than up so you can use bars you can use candlesticks whatever whatever you want to use and again i would just say whatever visually works best for you to identify the vcps use that so if you do that better with bars use bars if you do that better with candlesticks use candlesticks that's simple weak closes few strong closes a close below the 20 day moving average soon after the breakout is a very bad signal even worse if it closes below the 50 day very soon after the breakout volatile price action in terms of to the downside as well okay price should really just go to the upside the stock squats after the breakout and doesn't reverse high so it kind of goes pulls back down on that day and then it just doesn't reverse back high it just then kind of falls back down into the uh, into the pivot so that there is concluding that section in the next section we're going to be going into how do leaders act i've got some really interesting charts lining them up versus the market so you can get a much better sense of how do these leading stocks act how do leaders act so the best stocks as a quote from minavini the best stocks make their lows before the market bottoms so i've got some really interesting charts to be taking you through let me just explain it first so what we've got on the top chart is we've got a chart of a stock. In this case, for the first one, we have got eBay, but we're going to be looking at we're going to be looking at eBay, Amazon, Amgen, all sorts. We're going to be uh, we're going to be going through. So we've got eBay loaded on the top on the weekly chart, and then below that we have got the Nasdaq Composite, and I've lined the dates up as well. So both of these are weekly charts. Now there's some key points that I want to illustrate to you. What is happening from a structural perspective? What is happening from a relative strength perspective as well? So we can see with eBay, eBay bottoms here in just before two, just before 2001. So in Q4 of 2000, eBay puts this bottom in here, and then it starts building higher lows in the base. But what do you notice the Nasdaq Comp does? Well, the Nasdaq Composite actually makes a lower low. So see here where eBay in October of 2021 is putting in a higher low. What is the Nasdaq Composite doing? The Nasdaq Composite in the same period is making a lower low. So eBay higher lows, Nasdaq Composite being the index, putting in lower lows, which is stronger eBay, right? And that's why you're seeing the relative strength line turn up. This is relative. This is relative strength. Then if we look at eBay here, to where the Nasdaq Composite puts in its low. So in October of 2002, do you see how eBay's gone higher low, higher low, whereas the Nasdaq Composite has gone lower low, lower low. So while the Nasdaq Composite is on its lows, eBay is trying to come out of this VCP. Do you see that? And how eBay is consolidating around these key moving averages. Look at the 52-week highs. Look at the 52-week highs. Whereas the Nasdaq Composite is below all of its longer-term weekly moving averages down here. So when the Nasdaq Composite puts on its low on the same week, eBay is trying to come out of a VCP base. That there is fascinating. So this is where the relative strength point by the end of this section the relative strength point should really be hitting home okay because if you think about some of the biggest winners in the market you think about coming out of bear markets you think about the ebays the amazons the amgens the teslas whatever it may be the market doesn't miss the best opportunities it doesn't miss it okay how do we find what the market deems the best opportunities are relative strength focus on the relative strength line let me go through i've got a fair few examples to be going through and hopefully it will really start sinking home so if we take a look at Amazon, this is in the early noughties bear market. So Amazon puts in its low here, okay, in around about September of two of 2001. Amazon puts its low in here, okay, but the Nasdaq composite thereafter makes a lower low, okay. See how it's making a lower low into September, October 
of 2002. See that, how it's making a lower low? What does Amazon do? Amazon puts in a big high low. Do you see the discrepancy here? That Amazon puts in a big high low, reclaiming all key moving averages and tightening up here. So some VCP action getting really, really tight. The volume dries up, whereas the index is making a lower low. We all know what Amazon then did over the next 20 years, right? I'm not saying that you were then held it for the next 20 years, but the market doesn't miss the best opportunities. There are just too many smart operators, smart, just hawk-eyed investors in the market to miss it. Relative strength is how we find it. Do you see the 52 week highs coming through? Do you see it? 52 week high after 52 week high. The market doesn't miss the best opportunities. This is Amazon again. This is in this is in uh, 2020, so the COVID bear market. See how as Amazon pulls back down here, look at the 52 week highs coming through. You see Amazon's relative strength. Then it puts in this little kind of low, this low pivot, low cheat in here, tightness in here, and it's nearly above all the key moving averages, where the, whereas the index isn't. Focus on the relative strength. Another one, this is Netflix. So sure you're all aware of this. So Netflix went on an absolute tear following the great, the great financial crash. So Netflix actually puts in its bottom over here. July, roughly, July, August, so the summer of 2007. Look at what the Nasdaq Composite did over that time period. So the Nasdaq Composite matches here, and then it puts in these lower lows into the low of October 2028, and then a further low, okay, into, into 2009. But where is Netflix? Well, the price of the Nasdaq Composite is below all of these key moving averages. It's been making lower lows. Netflix is up here. Netflix is making high lows, high lows, high lows. So then as that proverbial basketball, okay, is being lifted out, that pressure of the market holding the basketball underneath water is being lifted and the market starts to trend up, Netflix just goes on an absolute, absolute tear. Next one here, this is MNST. So this is, this is maybe the best example. And when we go on to the fundamentals, I'm going to show you the importance with Monster Beverages because it went on a huge run. You can see nine and a half thousand percent here. I'm going to show you the importance here, importance of accelerating earnings, sales, and also margins. But you see here, look at the NASDAQ composite during the same time period. It's making lower lows, lower lows. What's Monster Beverage doing? High low, high low, high low. And it's really hard to see here, but the tightness that was coming through, ridiculous. This is kind of a perfect VCP. It's probably the most perfect VCP or ever see on the monthly chart um, as as well. Look at the 52 week highs in the base. If the stock is hitting 52 week highs in the base, it's extremely strong. And then it starts breaking out here. The weight of the market is lifted and this basketball is just released from being underneath water. Up, up and away it goes. PHM, so we're now going back to the 1980s. Same principle. Do you see how P, how PHM here? See how it's building high lows? It gets this VCP action. Look at how the volume dries up. Look at the 52 week highs. Whereas the market is making a series of lower lows. So this stock here, even though the market then goes on to, so July 1982, this stock is breaking out of this VCP and then goes up, eight, it goes up 800%, whilst the index in the same time period goes up 80%. So this stock goes up 10 times more, 10x more, tenfold more than the index. It's breaking out before the index even makes it lows. The stock is extremely strong, and then it's breaking out on the weekly chart with a 52-week high. Do you see the importance of relative strength in the 52-week highs? Tesla, stock that I'm sure you will know. So point that I want to make on this one is if you take a look at Tesla on the weekly chart, it pulls back down to this red line, which is the 40-week, which is a 200-day moving average. So you see at this point here, Tesla holds above the red line, the 40-week moving average. Where's the index? It's below it's 40 week. It's also below its 100 week as well, this kind of navy blue line. So this is relative strength as well. Visually, where is the price of the stock in terms of relation to its moving averages versus say the index or the group or other stocks as well. So Tesla is holding its 40 week, whereas the index being the NASDAQ composite is below the red line by some much as well. Tesla then goes and builds this cup and handle. 52 week highs, 52 week highs. Do you think the market had identified that this could be a extremely strong stock? Of course it did. So there's your cup and handle type action. There's the tightness in price. So you get that VCP action on the weekly chart. Up, up and away Tesla goes. Looking at a couple of Angem back in the 1980s. So you see how the market is basically going sideways here. Maybe there's a little lower low here. But what do you notice Amgen's doing? Amgen is building higher lows, higher lows, higher lows, contracting. Look at the 52 week highs coming through as well. Look how the volume dries up. I know I'm banging on here, but it's really important to understand that relative strength will lead you to the best opportunities in the market if you trust the market's judgment. This one here, this is this should be screaming at you, okay? So this is Amgen here in the 1990s. Look, look, look at what the market is doing. Look at these lower lows that the market's making. So from early 1990 to late 1990 into kind of autumn, 
get into, into September, November. Look at the market. The market just falls off of a cliff here, especially here as well. But as the market is just tanking here, what's Amgen doing? Amgen's above pretty much all key moving averages, and it's just making a series of high highs and high lows. Look at the 52-week highs coming through. Okay, then from the first trigger bar, so this bar in here, Amgen goes up 300% while the index goes up 9%. Do you want to be in the index or do you want to be in the leading stock? Focus on the leaders. Relative strength is how you identify the leaders. This one here, this is ODFL. So again, this is in the early noughties bear market. So what is the index doing? Well, series of lower lows, lower highs, lower lows, lower highs, lower lows, lower highs, lower lows, lower highs, lower lows, lower highs. What is ODFL doing? This is a trucking stock as well. What's it doing here? Well, it's actually putting in higher lows and making higher highs. And then look at all these 52 week highs in here. And then do you see how price it builds this little VCP, what well, decent sized VCP on the weekly chart gets really tight. The volume dries up. I know it's hard to see 52 week highs all over the place and then up, up and away it goes. It's coming out of a base before the index even makes its eventual low. Look at the 52-week highs. The stock is screaming at you if you focus on relative strength. This one here, this is an extreme example. Okay, This is NXGM. See how the index here, early noughties bear market, lower lows, lower highs, lower lows, lower highs, lower lows, lower highs. What's the stock doing? High highs, high lows, high highs, high lows, high highs, high lows. So look, look at this here. When the index puts in its low in September of, two, of 2002, this stock is coming out of a VCP. Here's one contraction, here's two contraction, here's three contraction, volume drop, 52 week highs. Focus on the leaders, guys. Next one here, this is GE, General Electric, back in the 1980s, so more in kind of its growth, growth phase. But the market is making lower lows, lower highs, lower lows, lower highs, lower lows, lower highs. What's GE doing? High lows, high highs, high lows, high highs, high lows, high highs. So it's coming out of a base while the index is still down here on its lows. Look at the 52 week highs telling you something and then the final one i've got of these as you're probably fed up with them this one here is decker's outdoor so see how the stock pretty much goes sideways during this time in here look at the rs line turning up in the 52 week highs what's the market doing well the market is making lower lows lower highs lower lows lower highs lower lows lower highs whereas the stock is pretty much going sideways and then look at the tightness that comes through here Okay, see the tightness that comes through, and then as the market starts trending up, so that proverbial weight of the market pushing that basketball underneath water is lifted, and you start to get that longer-term trend. Remember what we looked at with the NASDAQ composite and the monthly 10 May. As that weight is then lifted, and it can trend up, these are when these explosive stocks, the strongest ones in the market, as identified by relative strength, can really get going. So hopefully that, that there was, uh, was enlightening for you. In the next section, we're going to be looking at fundamentals of growth stocks. So what are the most important fundamentals of growth stocks? Well, in my view, there are three. And in Minavini's view, there are three as well. It's earnings, it's sales, and it is after-tax net margin. So earnings, sales, margins, and you'll see in his books, he refers to them as a code three, when all three are accelerating. So earnings, sales, and margins are the are the three most important things to be focusing on. So sales, how can a company increase sales? Well, they can raise prices and or they can sell more units of existing or new products. How does a company increase their margins? Well, they can raise prices, they can cut, they can cut costs of goods sold, they can improve productivity, they can remove losing and inefficient operations as well. Now, arguably one of the most important things is actually margins for increasing the earnings per share because stocks ultimately are driven by by their earnings i think it's a warren buffett quote where he says in the short term the market is a uh, in the in the short term the market is a voting machine in the long term it's a weighing machine and what he means by the weighing machine is in ultimately it comes down to the company's the company's earnings but a company can see massive price advances on the expectation of future earnings as well so i just want to give you this example and then we're going to start breaking down a uh, a couple of things so this is monster beverage and we looked at this on the weekly chart versus the nasdaq.com but here it is here on the monthly chart do you see so this is in the early noughties bear market take a look at these 52 week highs coming through you see this 52 week highs on the rs line the stock was screaming at you it's so strong the market does not miss the best opportunities it just doesn't that is my belief so see how you get these contractions you get one contraction two contraction three contraction you get nice shake out demand tails as well and then remember what we were talking about the one two punch the trigger bar really hard to see because it's so tight but sitting there right there on the monthly 10 ema you get this trigger bar, this one, two type action, and then the stock goes up around about 9,000% in the space of 35 months. Now, what was going on from an earnings per share, a sales and a net profit margins perspective? Well, in 2003, the earnings per share was 75% and the sales were plus 20% and the net profit margins for the year were 
5.4% versus 3.3% for the prior year. In 2004, we see an acceleration. So the earnings per share for the year are up to 214%, sales plus 63%, acceleration in the net profit margins from 11.3% from, sorry, up to 11.3% from 5.4%. We see a further acceleration in the earnings per share plus 195%, sales plus 93%, net profit margins accelerating from 11.3% to 18%. So when a company starts significantly accelerating its earnings, its sales, and really importantly, its net profit margins, which I'm going to show you on the next slide, and you get kind of the technical action setting up as well, as you can see here with Monster Beverage, you can get some almighty moves in the, uh, in, in the stock market. So let's just take a look here at the importance of margins. So this here is really telling. So let's imagine we have a software company and we've got a couple of scenarios. So this software company, its revenue is 10 million and its profit margin is 15% and it has 1 million shares outstanding. So we can work out the earnings per share and ultimately in the end, the company is going to be valued by its earnings. So you think about why is why is Amazon so big? Why is Apple so big? Why is Microsoft so big? It does, it does ultimately come down to the earnings of the company. So this company here is earning a dollar fifty in terms of the earnings per share. Okay, what if we, if for scenario one, we increase the revenue by fifty percent? So instead of the company's revenue being ten million, the only factor we change is fifteen million. Okay, sorry, we, the on, the only factor we change is the revenue. So we're going to increase it by fifty percent, which would be an increase of five million. So the company's revenue is now fifteen million. Profit margin stays the same. 15%. Shares outstanding stays the same of 1 million shares. So now we can work out that the company's earnings per share is $2.25, which is a 50% increase in the EPS. Now let's factor in the margin. So this is potentially why you saw such a huge advance in Monster Beverage, because the net profit margins went from 3% to 18%. So yes, having the earnings growth, yes, having the sales growth is very important, but having the margins improve as well is significant. Let me explain why. So in scenario two, we're going to keep the revenue the same as scenario one. So the 50% increase relative to our beginning example over here. But now we're going to increase the profit margin. Okay, we're going to move our profit margin from 15% to 30%. And you may be saying, ah, that isn't very much, it's only a 15% increase. Watch this. So the shares outstanding stay the same at a million. But now when we work through the calculation here, we now go up to $4.50 earnings per share. That is a 200% increase. So do you see the dramatic effect by if a company can increase its profit margin, increase its margins, the effect that it can then have on the earnings per share, it can be to a much greater extent, more kind of impactful than the, than the sales going up. Okay, really, really, really key to focus on the margins accelerating as well, because that can drive huge earnings per share increases. So let's go through a couple of other fundamentals as well. And this here is a quote from Minervini. So stocks very often top out while earnings still look good. Now I've got three stocks to be um, three stocks to be showing you. I think I've got Zoom, I've got Peloton, and I've got APPS apps as well. So this one here is actually Zoom. So we can see from the classic classic kind of uh, stage stage price cycle, we can see so the price cycle and, and the various stages. We can see stage one down here, stage two, stage three, and then stage four. What do you notice about the earnings coming through? Appreciate it may be a little bit hard to see, but when the stock tops out, when Zoom tops out here, the earnings are plus nine hundred ninety nine percent on the market smith. Remember, there's that there's that discounted trial if you're interested in uh, in a market smith market smith trial in the comments below. So you see in here nine hundred ninety nine percent nine hundred ninety nine percent, but the stock tops out. Very interesting, isn't it? So the stock can very often top out when the earnings are actually at their peak. Why? Because the market often views things is are things getting better or are things getting worse? So there was actually then a deceleration in the earnings thereafter. And this is about trusting the judgment, trusting the opinion of the market. So earnings then slip from 999% to 713% to 560%. There's still huge numbers coming out, but then look, 48%, 12%, 6%, minus 22, minus 23, minus four, minus five. So the market was then discounting the material slowdown that was going to come through in the earnings. So it can be very kind of illogical at first to kind of understand that, well, hang on a minute, the stock is reporting its biggest earnings and yet it tops out. This is where looking at the earnings, focusing on it, thinking, is this unsustainably high and how far has price come in the context of its price cycle? Has it just undergone a fourth or a fifth stage base? Has it just run up from $80 to $600 odd dollars? Okay, context is very, very important. This here, I think this one is Peloton. 
So Peloton builds a stage one base here. It runs up this stage two uptrend. And you can see for a couple of quarters, the company is profitable. You can see 259%, 211%, 190% the earnings per share. But the company then tops out here whilst it's reporting these very good earnings coming through on a quarterly basis. Well, then look there are then no earnings to speak of. So the market is then discounting the fact that, well, there's no earnings. It's, it's not it's not going to live up to the hype, that kind of future expectation that Peloton had of the big earnings of people kind of staying at home and their product and stuff like that fell away. And then you go stage three into stage four here. So the earnings, really important to, to focus on for these um, growth stocks. This one here, this is, I believe this is apps, this is APPS. So we can see here, the earnings are accelerating during this stage two uptrend. 67%, 160, 200, 320, 400. So the company is then topping out between its highest reported earnings on a quarterly basis, but it's then year over year, the percentages. So 320% here to 400% here is when the stock starts topping out. So remember that Minervini quit, the stocks can often top out when the earnings look very good. And then you start to see the slowdown. So albeit it's still high in triple digits, it is then materially slowing. 162, 193, 133, 56, 12, minus 23, minus 41, and it's in obviously then this stage four, in this stage four decline. Interesting, right? So let's take a look here. So this one here, this is Arista Networks. Ticker for this one is ANET. Ridiculously strong stock at the minute. And if we take a look, well, earnings per share on a year over year basis continue to tick up. So going from $1.40 to $2 to $2.5 to $2.87 to $4.5 to $5 to $6.5 for the estimates. Guidance coming through is good and the revisions are up. You can see that 27% plus 11%. And then take a look at the earnings and the sales here. Do you see how the earnings are accelerating on a quarterly basis and these percentages are year over year to just out the seasonality? 35%, 59%, 69%, 72% here, 27, 31, 49, 57, 55. Look at the relative strength line. Look at the stock breaking out of this big VCP base on the weekly chart. Ridiculously strong stock at the minute, but you can see the earnings, you can see the sales coming through there, and they are accelerating accelerating really 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 important this one here this is smci super micro computer so huge earnings coming through at the time of filming this and huge sales coming through as well so the earnings in the most recently reported four quarters 210 percent 223 percent 490 percent 270 percent and the sales plus 51 plus 53 plus 79 plus 54 and you've got an acceleration generally in the margins as well from six percent to eight percent to ten percent so earnings up sales up margins up look at what the stock is doing look at these rs lines ridiculously strong and then i've just circled in black here well we get a good sense of what are the large operators up to around the earnings so we can see gap ups here on volume and preferably well preferably you'd like to see strong closes but a lot of these closes are pretty strong as well we can see it in here and here and here and here to a lesser extent here and the earnings at the time of filming well when i put this slide together are coming out in a couple of weeks time so we'll see the reaction to the earnings currently basing quite well but focusing on earnings accelerating sales accelerating margins accelerating <clears throat> and what is the reaction to the earnings that's that's the most important thing it's not it's not what you're you're kind of reading the statement going oh i think this i think this no focus on the market reaction to the uh, to the earnings this one here another ridiculously strong stock which is on this is on the weekly chart great reaction to the earnings coming through huge relative volume coming through in there look at the estimates coming through for the this year and next year with the guidance up look at the sales accelerating 61 42 89 percent four quarters of triple digit earnings coming through this is a ridiculously strong stock so hopefully that there was a very good a kind of overview of fundamentals focus on for growth stocks in the next section we're going to be going through how to screen for vcps so how would you go about screening for vcps well minavini refers to his 95% club, which is characteristics of the biggest winning stock. So this is a study that he did, study that O'Neill did as well, and it's called factor monitoring. So what he's looking at is, okay, the biggest stocks, the stocks that have gone on, the, the biggest runs, those winning stocks, what were the characteristics of them? And then you reverse engineer it, basically. So 99% of them were above the 200-day moving average. And before I read out this list, this is important because it feeds into your screening criteria because you want to know, well, what did the biggest winning stocks do? And then your screening criteria has the parameters to find and that help identify these stocks that match those characteristics. So they are displaying similar characteristics to previous big winning stocks. So 99% were above their 200-day moving average. 96% were above their 50-day, 95% had a small flow under 30 million shares outstanding, 95% showed earnings accelerating, 96% began their big runs from general market correction and or pullback periods, 95% had a growth catalyst such as a new product, service or a positive company and or industry change, 70% reported earnings plus 20% in the most recent quarter, remember we're talking about the importance of earnings, 
and 80% IPO'd within the previous 10 years, and 98% of big winning stocks made the largest proportion of their gain in a stage two uptrend. So you refer to this, do you wanna be in the 98% club or the 2% club as well? So our screening and the VCP trend, trend, trend template, so the Minovini trend template, is looking for stocks that potentially meet those characteristics. So this is a trend template, there are eight parts to it. The share price above both the 150 day, 30 week and the 200 day, 40 week moving averages. The 150 day is above the 200 day moving average. The 200 day moving average is trending up for at least one month, preferably four or five months. The 50 day, 10 week moving averages is above the 150 and also the 200 day moving average. The current share price is at least 25% above its 52 week low. The current share price is within at least 25% of its 52 week high. IBD relative strength is greater than 70, preferably in the 90s. William O'Neill study found that the average relative strength rating, so from one being terrible, 99 being fantastic, the average relative strength rating was greater than 87 for the stocks when they actually broke out and went on run. So focusing on those top percentile um, stocks, really, really key in the market from a relative strength basis. Current share price is trading above the 50 day moving average, but within 8% for low for low cheat. So that there, it feeds into your screening criteria and it's based on the fact, that, okay, what are the big winning, what are the big winning stocks do? What, what characteristics do they resemble? And then your screening parameters are helping you to try and identify those stocks, which meet those, which meet those criteria. So you can run these trend templates in, uh, in the likes of Marketsmith. They have their own Minovini trend templates. You can create it in, in other charting softwares as well, if you, uh, if you want. And then on the next slide, we're going to be going more into risk management. I'm going to take you through optimal risk versus reward ratios. Okay, here we go with optimal reward to risk ratios. Now, this is going to feed into the risk management aspects, but also what I'm then going to cover there after this slide is the when to sell. So getting into some of the sell rules. So Minovini's got here. You always want to get odds on your money. So what we have here is we have risk versus reward and we have the break even win rate. So you want to get odds on your money because if your risk is three units and you're only getting one unit of return, your break even win rate is 75%. You have to be right 75% of the time just to break even. However, if you start getting odds on your money, so let's imagine that you risk one unit and you get three units back overall over a large, over a large, um, over a large series of trades, your break-even win rate doesn't have to be 75%, it has to be 25%. So this is about building in failure to your to your system, not having to be right all the time. So maintaining and controlling a healthy reward to risk ratio is very, very important. Now I've got a couple of examples down here. So we've got optimal, this should say reward to risk ratio of two to one and then optimal reward to risk ratio of three to one. Now I just want to give you an analogy here because this does then feed into the risk management and when to sell as um as well. So let's just do let's do this one over here, okay? And let's just do a hypothetical example. Let's say you go to the you go to the to the to the horse racing and there's gonna be there's gonna be ten there's gonna be ten races. Okay, and you're going to bet your entire capital, which isn't prudent in my view, but you're going to you're going to bet your entire capital on each race. Okay, and the question is, if you were to win on your winning trades, on your winning races, if you were to win three times more than on your losing races, but your win rate was only thirty percent, what would you pick? What percentage would you pick for those winning races? So remember that your winning races are going to be three times greater than your losses. So your wins will be three times greater than your losses on these proverbial horse races. What would you pick? Would you say, well, I want to win, I want to win 30% on the on the winning races and I want to then lose 10% on the losing races. Would you say, oh, I want to win 9% on the winning races and I then want to lose 3% on the, on the losing races. So remember, you're going to have three winning races, but you're going to have seven losing races. And this is compounded as well. So there is actually an answer to this because it is just, it's maths. So what is optimal there? Well, the optimal would be 21% to win on those three races and then to lose 7% on those seven losing races because you have a 30% win rate. That would give you a 10 trade, a kind of 10 race, if you like, compounded return on investment of 6.59%. That there is optimal. Nothing is more optimal at a 30% win rate. If we were to do that same scenario, 
okay, with a two to one, so reward to risk, reward to risk ratio of two to one. And again, it's the same kind of horse racing analogy that you were going to win four races out of 10. So you're going to have six losing horse races where you may say, well, I want to win 100% on my on my four winning races. And then I want to lose 50% because it's two to one on my um, on my six losing races. Well, actually, at the end of that, you would have lost 75% of your capital. The correct answer, if you like, is actually 20% on the four winning races and then losing 10% on the six losing races, 10 traded, 10 trade compounded return on investment at 10.2%. So this feeds into the trade management aspects. And I'm sure this is why William O'Neill and his book, How to Make Money in Stocks, kind of used the seven, the seven, eight percent. And he was indicating for people to sell around about 20%. Okay. But this here feeds into the when to sell part and the risk management side as well. So maintaining the risk versus reward, and I've got scenarios later on, is really, 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 really key. So when to sell. Minovini's sell rules are focused around these areas. Reward achieved is a multiple of risk. So remember that break-even win rate. Late stage base in an uptrend, price fails to hold key moving averages such as the 20 day or 50 day rapid price advance in a relatively short period of time. So I've got some examples of all of these when we get into it. So the general rules for selling or reducing when swing trading, this is what Minervini says. Selling into strength, multiple of risk is achieved. Consider selling half a moving stop on remaining position to break even or at least tighten up your stop to lessen your original risk. I've got some really good examples later on for you guys as well in terms of break even trades, free rolling trades, and thinking about that as this is a fairly complex area to um, to be to be to be going through. So I've got some nice examples. If your profit is more than your average gain and a multiple of your risk, generally two to three times, consider trailing a stop or selling half and moving your stop up. You you could also backstop your average gain or an amount you want to lock in. Stock is extended and opens up on a gap. Consider selling at least half or trail a tight stop. Next one, these are general rules for selling or reducing when swing trading. So selling into weakness, hits predetermined stop loss out, no questions, closes below 20 day moving average, below your purchase price soon after a breakout from a proper base, reduce shares three to four days of lower lows without supportive action on a three to four day, increases the odds of failure, heavy heavy selling with full retracement soon after low volume breakout, sell, key reversal on heavy volume when stock is extended, sell at least half. Then we've got some sell alerts. So these are general rules for again selling or reducing when swing trading but these are sell alerts so accelerated rate of advance parabolic kind of blow off climactic top after extended move stock after extended move stock moves up 20 to 50 percent in one to three weeks 12 or 15 days up over three weeks largest up day since the beginning of the move look for reversal of churning over the next one to four days so that's where price is kind of it's not going anywhere but there's higher volume that's called uh, that's called churning largest daily price spread since advance started largest weekly price spread since beginning of advance six to ten days of accelerated advance with all but two to three days up exhaustion gap after the stock is extended so usually the second or third gap. So this would be a stock that's trended up, maybe it's up 50%, 70%, and then it starts kind of gapping up and there's been a couple of gaps before. New high on low volume, new highs from late stage base, so four fifth or six stage bases. I'm going to show you that with LUV on the weekly chart. Heavy volume with little price progress, that's kind of stalling churning action. Drop below the 50 day moving average line on the heaviest daily volume since the beginning of the move. That can indicate that there's distribution by larger operators. Largest one day decline since the beginning of the move and the largest weekly decline on huge volume. Again, institutions potentially offloading their shares. And again, down on largest volume, institutions potentially offloading their shares. So let's go for a couple of examples. So this is the late stage base. So this one here, this is LUV Southwest Airlines Company on the weekly chart. So it's clearly a leader here. Look at all these 52 week highs coming through. Base one, base two, base three, base four, base five. These bases do not continue forever because if you think logically about it, large operators were accumulating in the lower bases and then up here, they're then looking to offload their shares. They've made their money. They've made their returns. The so stock here from the base one moves from around about $14, $15 up to a high of around about $45. They've made their money. And up here, this is where actually you've got to be a little bit cynical. You could get some really bullish news articles coming out on mainstream media um, outlets potentially the company as we saw like with the zooms or the pelotons are reporting very big quarterly earnings coming through and then the earnings are going to start slipping so large operators then start getting out ahead of that i cannot stress how much more informed large operators are than you they are ridiculously well informed relative to you as a retail trader so again really 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 focus on the judgment of the market apply some common sense if you can count base one base two base three base four base five it's probably getting a little bit long in the uh, in the tooth and you've got to then be expecting that that stage two uptrend is going to turn into a stage three distributional top at some point 
price fails to hold key moving averages such as the 20 day or 50 day. So this one here, this is FedEx and you can see a nice VCP action, okay reaction to the earnings then it holds up, tightness, one two punch coming through in here and then the black line is the 10 EMA, the blue line is the 21 EMA for me, I use the 21 EMA so that's what I put on my chart and then the purple line here is the 50 SMA, there's the close below the 50 SMA. So again, thinking about trailing stops as well, we're, we're going to talk about kind of free rolling, so improving your worst case scenario, many, many of you calls this, getting to break even and then thinking about trailing stops. So if you're an intermediate term trend follower, that's probably more so going to be say the 20 day or the 21 EMA and also the 50 SMA, so the 50 day moving average as well, this purple line here. So thinking about riding those intermediate term trends and then this one here price fails to hold key moving averages such as the 20 day or 50 day so this is this is overstock this is where i bought it coming through in here so vcp action tight 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 you get the one two punch lowest volume bar in the base and then it gets out here and then here's the break of the 21 here's the break of the 50 SMA, and the stock goes on a run from 28 dollars to over 100 dollars up there but you can then see when you start taking out these moving averages and those violations start piling up of kind of what i call bearish synchronicity so widespreads increased volume slicing through key moving averages thinking logically about okay the stock's made a big run here looks like it's kind of topping out here just negative price action coming through slicing through key moving averages no longer holding them be thinking about selling so i use key moving averages as a as a trading stop after i have free rolled the trade qualcomm so this is the rapid price advance so in a relatively short period of time so uh, Qualcomm builds a nice base here. One contraction, two contraction, three contraction. Look how the volume dries up. 52 week highs in the base as well. Remember what we were saying 52 week highs in the base. It's extremely strong. And then in the space of three weeks, goes up around about 97%. And look at the high volume coming through as well. So we know the larger operators are active because of the high volume. And Qualcomm was kind of a, a, can, a can slim leader at the time um, as, as well. But then you have to think, well, you've got huge volume. Price has gone up nearly 100% in three weeks. Is this more likely institutions accumulating up here or? potentially distributing or offloading some of their shares what do you think again apply a little bit of common sense think about the price cycle so on and so forth what i would say and this is just me personally this is not a minivini kind of um rule it's just something me and my own trading if i start to see a stock that's had a rapid price advance in a relatively short period of time i invariably won't just randomly sell it because i think it's extended i'm going to sell it what i will invariably do is go lower the bar lower the bar lower the bar lower the bar certainly on the daily chart so i will go lower the bar so lower the day, lower the day, lower the day, lower the day, maybe with part of my stop loss or all of my stop loss on the remaining part of the position. For me, I found that's a much more effective way to be choking off when you see these rapid price advances in a relatively short period of time. So i.e. price gets extended from the 10, from the 10 EMA. So if you went lower the bar, lower the bar, lower the bar, lower the bar, you'd be choking it off up here. So rather than trying to like randomly guess because, well, on this day here, on the open here, you may have thought at $70, oh, this is really, really extended. Well, then price went up to over $100 on this day here. So for me, uh, my, my biggest mistakes are actually selling winners too early. So a rule that I have for myself is I'd much rather go lower the bar, lower the bar, lower the bar. So you see in here, see this prior rally here as well. Well, if you went, imagine on this bar here, you went, ah, oh, this is really, really extended. Look at it, it's extended. Um, it's gapped up again, following the earnings, there's huge volume, uh, I'm getting out. Well, lower the day, 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 you're gonna be taken out somewhere up here. For me, lower the bar, lower the day is much more effective. That's just my own kind of experience that I'm throwing in there. And in the next section, we're gonna be going on to risk management. Okay, risk management, which is arguably the most important concept in Minovini's books and also of this presentation here. So this is probably where a lot of you are gonna fall asleep and, and hit and hit snooze and turn off this video, but I actually think this section here, risk management, is the most important section of the video. So let's go through a couple of quotes for Menavini, because I just want to kind of give you a broader overview of his, of his philosophy and his mindset around risk management. Not losing big is the single most important factor for winning big. As a speculator, not, not sorry, as a speculator, losing is not a choice, but how much you lose it. So the first sentence there, not losing big is the single most important factor for winning big. Not identifying perfect VCPs, not identifying perfect power plays, no, not losing big is the single most important factor for winning bit. There's a simple way to avoid a huge loss in a stock. Sell when you have a small loss. In four decades of trading, I haven't found a better way to manage risk. The reason many traders and investors fail to do this is ego, so getting into the emotions or a poor understanding of risk. And I'm gonna show you some scenarios which will really drill, really drill at home in terms of understanding risk and the negative effects that large losses have on your portfolio. If you want to mitigate risk effectively, you simply must acknowledge that stocks don't manage themselves. You're the manager and it's up to you to protect your hard earned capital. 
With each buy order I enter, I know the exact price where I'm going to sell at a loss if things don't work out as expected. I define this price level before I get in. Trading without a stop loss is like driving a car without brakes. I've heard some pundits say trading with a stop loss is foolish. Only a fool would make such a statement. The goal for optimal stop loss placement is to set it at a level that will allow the stock price enough room for normal fluctuation, but close enough to the danger point that there's not too much risk mathematically. So we're going to go through some examples and I've got a little quiz for you as well. But hopefully this slide here is really illustrating the emphasis that Minervini puts on risk management so what you can control what do you have control over well you have control over what you buy when you buy how much you buy and when you sell you have no control over how much a stock advances or percentage of winning trades Mina Vini then talks about the holy grail. So losses are a function of where you're targeting and achieving your average gain. So how much can you expect to gain on average? How often can you expect to be right on average? So this is why tracking your statistics is very, very important. Certainly kind of keeping a rolling five trade or 10 trade, or maybe even 15 trade, but I would certainly say somewhere around 10 trade, okay, kind of tracking that over the last 10 trades is important. And we're going to look at that in the progressive exposure point as well. So we have the trading triangle. We have average gain, average loss, and we have the batting average. So so the holy grail, we have the average gain times by percentage of winning trades divided by the average loss times by percentage of losing trades equals the average win loss ratio. And you want that to be positive, preferably two to one. So that there is the average win loss ratio. So let's imagine we have example one, trader, trader A. Their average gain is 10% and their percentage of winning trades is 50%. Their average loss is 5% and their percentage of losing trades is 50%. They have an average gain to loss ratio of 2 to 1. That there is healthy. Example 2, that this trader has an average gain of 15% and a, and a percentage of winning trades of 40% with an average loss of 5%. So they're 3 to 1 in terms of the, risk, the reward to risk. And the percentage of losing trades 60%. They're still coming in profitable overall at 2 to 1. So this is very important stats to be tracking. And let's go for a couple of return scenarios to really drill it home. So scenario one, this is a 50% win rate. We can see that they're coming in with 14% winners and 7% losers. Now it does not, it absolutely does not come in this perfectly. It's just to show you the importance and on the next slide of maintaining your losses. So really controlling your losses, I should say, not letting them get out of hand because you're going to see what happens when they get out of hand. So this here is coming in. They have a reward to risk ratio of two to one and they are right 50% of the time. 10 traded compounded return on investment. That would be putting your entire capital into every single trade. I don't do that at all but that would be 33.95% just to illustrate the point. Over here, now their win rate drops to 40%, but they're still able to maintain that two to one reward to risk ratio. So 14%, Winning trades and then the losing trade, 17%. Still profitable after 10 trades. Compounded return on investment, 9.27%. Scenario three, now their win rate goes down to 30%, but they're able to maintain a three to one gain to loss ratio. So the winners are 9%. So it has three winning trades in this scenario of 9% and then seven losing trades of 3%, but they still come out profitable 4.64%. Again, it's really understanding the math behind this and the importance of controlling the risk. Now, scenario four, this is more so how I how I like to trade personally. I like to go for the for the big winner. Obviously, control the risk, keep it really tight, but try and but try and get the big winner in there. So this is a 40% win rate, but we're putting in one one outsized gain, if you like, 50% coming in, then 15%, 10%, 5%, and then keeping the losses at 3% and 5%. 10 trade compounded return on investment would be 55%. So this is just something something that I then want to feed into the sell rules and just illustrate the point that actually. Well, I think it's a much, and again, this is what Minervini is kind of talking about with trailing stops as well, potentially using, say, the, the 20 day or the 50 day or something like that to try and keep some back for the big, the, the big winner. I think getting the big winner is extremely, extremely important. It's not going to happen every trade by, by all means. Absolutely not. But getting that, getting that odd, getting that odd big winner, chucking in as well and maintaining a very healthy reward to risk relationship. I can see, uh, I, I personally think it's very, very important. You can see that with the returns coming in um, as, uh, as well. So this slide here. Don't be these traders, okay? I'm sure you all know someone. Um, you, you, I'm sure you all know someone who trades like this. Maybe, maybe it was you in a in a former former trading life, so to speak. But look at this here. This trader is doing the exact opposite of what you want to do. They have small wins, three percent. They're right fifty percent of the time there, okay? They're, they're they're pleased with themselves. Well, I have a fifty percent win rate. I'm a I'm a good trader, okay? Wins, three percent, six percent, nine percent, twelve percent, fifteen percent. But their losses are way out of hand here. 10%, 15%, 20%, 25%, 30%, 10 trade compounded return on investment, they've lost half their capital. They've had a drawdown of over 50%. This trader over here, they're going, well, 
I have a 50% win rate and my average gains are coming in at 25%. Yeah, but look at look look at your average losses. You're not controlling the downside. So yes, they have five winning trades at 25%, but they have five losing trades at 25% as well. They've nearly lost a third of their capital, 10 trade compounded return on investment after 10 trades. Don't be those traders. Maintain that really healthy reward to risk ratio. Keep your losses in check. Keep them in check, keep them low. Keep them low on a relative basis, especially if you're swing trading. So let's now do some examples. I've got two examples to do to try and involve you a little bit more interactive. Where should you place your stop loss? Example one. So let's say the pivot is gonna be here. We've got a nice VCP with three contractions. So our pivot is gonna be $100. The three contractions lows are 90, which is 10% stop loss, 95, 5%, 97, 3%. But this is important to know, well, what's happened over your last 10 trades. So for this example, let's imagine your average gain on your last 10 trades is 10% and your winning percentage is 50%. So if your average gain on your last 10 trades is 10%, does it make any sense to place your stop loss down here at 10%? Probably not, right? Remember this trade here? Well, I'm winning 25%. Yeah, but your losses are 25% as well, mate, okay? Keep it in check. Keep that reward to risk ratio very, very healthy. So here it's gonna make much more sense to either be at 5% or potentially 3% as well. Because if you're putting your stop loss at 3%, then you're shooting more for a reward to risk ratio of 3 to 1 if your gains have been coming in at around about 10%. Okay, So somewhere between 5% and 3% would be the correct answer here. Let's then do another one. Where should you place your stop loss? Example number two. So for this example, let's imagine your average gain on your last 10 trade is 6%. So it's now dropped from 10% to 6% and your winning percentage has dropped from 50% to 40%. Now where do you place your stop loss? Same setup here, but because of what's happened over your last 10 trades, now where do you position your stop loss? Does it make any sense to go down here at 10%? Absolutely not. Why? Because the, your risk is a function of where you're targeting and achieving your average gain. So it doesn't make sense to have a stop loss wider than where you have been coming in with your average gain over your last 10 trades. Does it really make sense to even go here now at, at, at 95, at 5%? Probably not, because again, if, you're, if your average loss is then coming in at 5% and you're winning 6%, that's not a healthy reward to risk ratio. You've got to tighten it up even more. So this could be an example of a harder time, harder trading environment that you are trading through. And it's what most people do is they widen their stop losses. They give it more room. No, do the opposite. Tighten it, tighten it, tighten it. So here, 3% would be the would be the right place to go. And then you're still looking for two for two to one. Hopefully that there makes sense. Now let's go into improving your worst case scenario. So this here is example number one. So Minavini, multiple of risk achieved, consider selling half and moving a stop on remaining position to break even or at least tighten your stop up to less than your original risk. So let's say we have got this nice VCP forming and our pivot is gonna be $100. We've got one contraction, two contraction, three contraction, and we place our initial stop loss here at 5%, just underneath $95. So what Minavini is selling here is multiple of risk achieved, consider selling half. Well. If the share price moves up here to $110, that is going to be two times our initial stop loss. So therefore, we could sell half of the position and move our stop loss to break even. So if our entry is at 100, our stop loss is at 95, well, two times that in terms of the risk, so 5%, we need 10% gain would be up to 110, which we're imagining is up here. So when that is achieved, we could sell half the position at 110 and then move the stop loss to break even. Hopefully that there makes sense. Let me now add a little bit more spanners into the work. So improving your worst case scenario, example number two. So let me just take you through some free rolling maths here. So the free roll levels, assuming everything is in single is in single digit percentages. You could sell half at one times your stop loss. That can be your initial stop loss, or it could be where you move your stop loss to. Okay, You do not always need to look to get break even or free roll where your initial stop loss is. You can move your stop loss up, which I'm going to teach you. One third of your position at two times your stop loss, or one quarter of your position at three times your stop loss. So let's go through an example here. So let's say we are buying stock ABC, and we're going to buy it through the highs of this VCP here at 100. And let's imagine we get filled at a hundred dollars i invariably use a buy a buy stop limit order and have kind of the limit the limit area so i know where where i'm going to get filled what's the maximum amount of shares that i'm willing to pay okay that then all feeds into the trade management aspects of this as well so my entry is going to be here at a hundred dollars and let's say that i'm going to place my initial stop loss here at 95 dollars. so this second contraction five percent however in my head i know that there's this higher contraction at 97 dollars. so let's say my average gain has been coming in at 15 percent for the last 10 trades so i go no oh, i can go in with a with a five five percent stop give this stock room initially as well so in here 
this is going to be my initial stop. However, when I'm planning out the kind of free rolling aspects of the trade, so Minervini uses the, um, the the analogy of improving his worst case scenario. We always want to try and improve our worst case scenario because when we initially enter a trade, it's all risk to us. So what I'm then thinking here is, well, I could move my stop loss from $95 to $97. That's the next logical place. So I can mitigate risk by moving my stop loss up higher from 95 to 97. But initially, it's a healthy reward to risk relationship because I've been coming in with 15% average gains. Therefore, I'm going in with a 5% initial stop. That's three to one. Okay, nice and healthy. But then I'm looking at this final contraction, $97, which would be 3%. Now what I know as well is, well, if I was to move my stop loss from 95 to $97, then I'd need a move to 106. $106 because that would be two times where my new stop loss would be. Okay, so that means I could then sell one third of my position into 106 and then move my stop loss from 95 to 97 to free roll the trade. Now, what Minervini was talking about here. And again, this is all you and how now, this is really this is really in the weed stuff. Okay, this is very, very advanced stuff here. What Minervini is saying is, he would rather wait for a bigger move and then put a stop loss to break even. For me, how I like to free roll trades is I would rather see a smaller move and maintain a wider stop loss. This is how I do it. So in this instance here, let's say, we'll just keep the numbers really small. Let's say you buy three shares at $100. So your total invested is $300. And our stop loss, we're going to move our stop loss from 95 to 97 in a second, which is going to be 3% because this is kind of then my logical place to move it to and then I can free roll into 106. So my total risk on the trade when I move my stop loss up because you could have scenarios here of 95 and then I need a move I need a move to one to 110 up here like we were doing on this last one but I have multiple scenarios so I'm going well I could free roll 95 into 110 um, like that or I could be doing it like this so I'm working out different different kind of scenarios and perm and perm and, and, perm, and permutations as the trade is unfolding so total risk on the trade here would be nine dollars instead of fifteen dollars down here so that means I could sell one third at 106 which, which would be six percent so I could lock in six dollars profit so my total risk on the trade left would be six dollars why because I have two shares with a stop loss at 97 $7, so there's $3 risk per share associated with that. So I've locked in $6 and then I'm selling $6. I'm sorry, I'm locked in $6 profit and then there is $6 risk left on the trade side through all the trade. So the different permutations, I'll probably do a really detailed video on this um, kind of explaining mitig mitigation maths. But then what you're looking for is natural reaction, tennis ball action, higher highs and higher lows. So in the next slide, we're going to be going into progressive exposure. Okay, progressive exposure. So this is a quote from Minabini. You want to be trading your largest when trading your best and trading your smallest when trading your worst. Well, how do you do that? Take a look at your results. So we imagine here, we've got scenario one and we've got scenario two, okay? And let's say for scenario one, trader, trader one, these are what's happened over the last 10 trades and we could look at compounded return on investment as well that's putting all view of capital into it i wouldn't suggest that it's just so we can get these figures coming out so here they had a win of 15 percent, and then they lost seven seven six four three and then they had a string of winners 10 percent, 20 percent, 20 percent, 25 percent. okay they're now potentially in they're in sync with the market the market is rewarding their strategy scenario two so trader two for example has a 40 percent win rate and their last 10 trades look like this 15%, 10%, 7%, 6%, minus 8, minus 4, minus 5, minus 6, minus 7, minus 5. They are pretty much flat over the last 10 trades. Which trader should get aggressive? Do you see how easy this concept is? If you track and analyze your results like this, you can visually look, have a have a rolling string of your last, your last 10 trades or something and look and go, is the market rewarding my strategy right now? Is this a market that I want to be fully invested in? Because if you're not making money at 50% invested, what is the point of going to 100% invested? If your last 10 trades look like this and you've been, say, somewhere between 25% and 50% invested, is there any point going to 100% invested? Absolutely not. Why? Because the market is giving you feedback and it's saying, this is not the time to be pushing for you however you could then start having a couple of trades come through like we saw here with scenario one where okay suddenly you're getting some gains coming through suddenly there's some good trades coming through they're getting out the gate well you think about those positive and negative signals that we were looking at after the breakup suddenly you start to see more positive signals coming through you start to see the trend of the market is acting better as well so on and so forth so it's really about analyzing your own results and then just applying some common sense and going hmm, this, this is this is what my last six trades look like there's no point pushing the exposure in terms of being 100% invested in this market right now. This is obviously more applicable for, for swing trading because the market is just not rewarding my strategy. I need to trade. I need to trade lighter, peel it back. So the progressive exposure point is to help you trade your largest when you're trading your best.
okay, and get more invested in the market, but be kind of out of the market trading much smaller when you're potentially trading your worst or the market is more hostile to your strategy. So on the next slide, we're going to go into position sizing. Okay, position sizing. So the guidelines here, this is Minervini, <clears throat> one and a quarter percent to 2% of, of risk of total account equity per trade. I actually think that's very, very, very on the high side. I don't very be risk more than 1%. Eight to 10% absolute max stop loss per trade. Average loss no more than five to 6% per trade. Never take a position larger than 50% of total account equity. Shoot for optimal 20 to 25 positions. You wanna have four to five big positions, six to 18 stocks max. So what he's saying is be more concentrated in the leaders. So I'm just going to give you an example here to work through. So let's say your account size is 100k, your position size is 10%, so you're going to put 10k in, your stop loss is 10%, so your total risk is not 10k, it could be if the stock if the stock goes to zero, um, theoretically it is possible, but your total risk on the trade is 1k, which is total account equity risk of 1%, okay? In account size number, in, sorry, in example number two, account size is the same, position size is the same, but we're just ch changing the stop loss from 10% to 5%. So now the total risk is not $1,000, uh, $1, it's $500. So the account equity risk is half. So instead of going for 1% of total account equity risk, it's now 0.5%, 0.5% total account equity, equity risk. So you can see how you can tighten up the risk to your total account by looking for those tighter entries. So remember those examples we're going through. Do you want to go in with a 10% stop loss, a 5% stop loss, a 3% stop loss? It all feeds in. You could have the same position size, but be risking much, much less. So hopefully that there helps a little bit on position sizing. And in the next one, we're going to be going into Minervini trading rules. Okay, here are 14 Minabini trading rules. Always trade with a stop loss. Know where you're getting out at a loss before you get in. Plan your trade up. Never add to a losing position that's averaging down. Losers average losers. Scale up when trading well, scale down when trading poorly. That's the progressive exposure point. Only go overweight a position in the direction of the trade. Cut overweight proportion of the trade if it moves against you as soon as possible. Consider trimming XX position if the stock fails to move as expected. Never hold a large position into a major report. Never let a good size gain turn into a loss. Move your stop loss up to break even as soon as possible. So that there is the free rolling that we were talking about a little bit earlier on. I like to kind of free roll and then maintain a wider stop loss by selling one third like I was showing you. But what Minavini is saying there, in essence, as he said, get to break even, position yourself beyond the possibility of defeat. That there is a Sun Tzu art of war principle. When there is a material change in behavior, sell immediately. So be on the lookout for those change of characters. Look for follow-up buying after a breakout. Do not have favorites, buy stocks in order of breakouts. There's another very good quote, which is do not, which is do not marry stocks, just date them. Evaluate your positions, date every day, always think in terms of risk versus reward. Minavini, 17 reasons, the top reasons most traders fail. So one, poor selection criteria. They're trading penny stocks, tips, rumors, media hype. They don't cut, they don't cut losses. Number one mistake, risk management has been a key theme throughout this presentation, and it is a key theme in Minavini's books. Add to a losing position, so they average down. That's the number one reason traders blow up. Fail to scale back exposure when trading poorly and all the markets hostile to their style. Fail to scale up aggressively on the heels of success when you're in that healthy kind of easy dollar Minervini refers to environment. Don't nail down profits when they have them. Let decent gains turn into losses. Over trade, under trade. They don't know the truth about their trading. They fail to manage risk to risk versus reward relationships, the holy grail. They don't commit to a strategy. They have style drift, shiny object syndrome. Want too much too fast. They have an unrealistic learning curve. They trade too large. They over diversify. They don't concentrate or well, they concentrate too much on reward and not, not enough on the risk. They don't follow their own rules, lack of discipline. Then he has eight keys to super performance. So four keys to big returns, timing, concentration, turnover, managing risk versus reward relationship. Four keys to low drawdowns, sell into strength, trade directionally, progressive exposure, and protect your break even point. Then we have here developing a winning mindset. So Minervini wrote a book on, on mindset, and I'll just give you my 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 kind of three my three main key takeaways from the uh, from the book is have a clear vision of who of who you want to be and what you want to become. It's your choice, so it's empowering. It's your choice. What do you want to be? Who 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 is it? You you really want to be? It's your choice. Reverse engineer the goal and put daily systems and processes in place to get you to the desired goal, and then stay relentlessly disciplined. So it's basically decide who it is you want to be, then decide on reverse engineer it. Decide on the daily systems, processes, habits that that 
that person would have and then stay very very disciplined on executing those systems those processes those habits on a daily basis and then finally improve your vcp skill set so there's three quotes here the old adage tells us that practice makes perfect except it doesn't practice only makes a habit it takes perfect practice to make perfect that's minavini quote then there's a great quote here by james clear you do not rise to the level of your goals you fall to the level of your systems your goal is your desired outcome your system is the collection of daily habits that will get you there we are what we repeatedly do excellence there is excellent then that should say is not an act but a habit that's aristotle so what are the daily systems and processes habits moving you towards your goal so three daily habits you could implement to improve your vcp skill set over the next three months are one create a model book with 1000 perfect vcps now 1000 may sound like a lot but it's just 11 a day can you find for the next three months 11 perfect vcps per day and put them in a model book and annotate them. I think you can. Run daily scans. So we were talking about the scans earlier to find perfect VCPs like in your model books. Positive vis visualization, meditation of the trader you want to be. Those are the three things I think you could do over the next three months to really improve your skill set. So it's about having the knowledge, but then it's also developing and having the skill acquisition. So hopefully this has given you good knowledge, but you now want to have the skill acquisition. So thank you very much for watching this video and I look forward to seeing you in a future one.